So I'm the library director here at Stockholm University, and I'm also the vice chair of the Bibsam Consortia that negotiates all the license resources for Sweden. I'm within the Rector's Conference in the Open Science Group there, and other things. And I, in EUA, work on the Open Science Group there as well, the European University Association. So I work both local, national, and international with those questions. So I will talk about open science, a little bit about facts, opportunities, and challenges mostly for Stockholm University, but for the whole international bit of it. And um, you may, during when I talk, raise your hand and ask questions if it is something you want to discuss. But it will be filmed, so you know that. <laughs> so open science is something we have started to discuss the last 10 years, maybe. And I think about open access, we have discussed about 20 years. Mostly about open science, you have, here is the common definition of open science. So it's both open data, open source, open methodology, open peer review, open access, open education resources. Citizen science, we often take to open science. So it's an, I think, philosophical idea about that science should be open and be built on, and that we can do science in another way than we have done the last couple, couple of decades. So I will mainly focus on open access and open data during this talk. So who are influences open science? I think we should start with the researchers and the doctoral students and the students. Of course, they are influencing open science and it should be for the researchers and driven by the researchers. But then we have politics. EU is really driving open science now as a political agenda. The society and you have ethics and law, research infrastructures. Now, if you get a project from uh, the research council, you have to have a data management plan. That is driving open science as well. And research organizations like EUA, publishers are driving it other way, and the founders. It's a lot of opinions about what open science is for and how we are driving open science. I think it should be centered around the researchers, but we have all these kinds and we have to work together to get something out of it. Of course, when you talk about things, there are a lot of opinions. I haven't read all those books, but these are only a few ones. So there is really much written about it. It a lot talks about it. It's in the political side and it's in the philosophical side and everything. A lot of blue papers and roadmaps how to go to open science. Then we have the research bill in 2016 says we should in Sweden make a transition to open access. The goal is that the transition to open access to research results, including scientific publication, artistic works, and research data, should be fully implemented in a 10 years perspective. So that is what the government say to us. And this was 2016, so 2026, it should be all open if you listen to the government. And how are the government working? They have given two directives. One about open access. It's given to the National Library in Sweden, Kungliga Biblioteket. And they have today a task to coordinate the work among open access. And they have an open access advisory group and the National Working Group on Open Access. So, 
And we have the Bibsum Consortia within the uh, National Libraries framework, but it's steered from the university, we're steering group from the universities. Then the Swedish Re Research Council, they got a coordination to research data, and they have a national reference group. And they are working on that. I'm in the national reference group for the Research Council working on the research data. So those are the directives going from uh, <coughs> the government. And they say that both the National Library and the Research Council should work together and then work with the universities, of course, otherwise it should, would be crazy. So uh, this is how we are working now. This is the coordination of open access at National Library. And as we say, a transition should be fully realized within 10 years, 2026. Then you probably heard about EU is driving 2020. At 2020, everything should be that is public, pu published on public money should be open. But I think the most important is that the, all the stakeholders should work together towards this goal. And the researchers are the most important stakeholder. At the National Library, when they got their task, they were thinking about what are the problems to implement open access to publications. So we had five studies conducted by people from, it has been researchers within, it has been from the founders, it has been from the libraries, from the Young Academy, has been within these studies. And those studies were, we made them public and gave it to the government three weeks ago. And one of the biggest thing I think that hinders the evaluation, oh no, the development of open access is the current merit system, how we are looking at impact factors, how we get our jobs, how we get our promotion. And that is really hard to discuss because it's really international. If we do something in Sweden, and we will come back to that in the discussion about Plan S, because that's why Plan S has been such a big debate about Plan S, is if we just do it in Europe, what happened with the other countries and everything. So the merit system, I think all that talks about open access and open data, they talk about how can we change the merit system. Here at Stockholm University, we have now signed DORA, the San Francisco, San Francisco Declaration on Research Assessment. That, and we say that we shouldn't be counted on where we publish, we should be counting on what, and we shouldn't use the impact factors for evaluation and things like that. Stockholm University has just signed it, but then we have to start to implement it. And that's, uh, it's easy to sign, but to implement it's harder. But I think that the president will start working with this and the university management with the door assignment. Then funding for a transition from a subscription based to an open access publishing system, that is also really hard because we have money from different places. The reading fees are often paid by the universities. The publishing fees, the APCs, are often paid by the founders. And the publishers want more and more money. So we have to work together and say that this is the money that is within the system. It's no more money because the founders are here in the libraries. So that's interesting and we say in the study that we have to work together. Then it's about open access to scholarly monographs. It's hard with articles. Monographs is even harder. And financial and technical support to converting peer review and scholarly journals from tall access to open access, and that is, we have a lot of Swedish uh, publications as well 
in the Swedish language and we want to have that to open access as, as well and how we can help them. And then monitoring the compliance with open access and about policies and mandates was the last study. And that includes the CC BY license and recommendations on how to use the CC BY license. This is the president of Stockholm University, Astrid Söderberg-Widing, and she says, give open access and open science the attention they deserve. And this is taken from the research data policy. Stockholm University advocates the availability of its research and research results through a research and education environment that promotes, encourages and informs about open science as a practice. That's good I'm here talking about it because we are promoting that from the university to work that way. And I think that in Sweden, Stockholm University really is the driver for open science and Astrid is really driving nationally and internationally to make open science come through. EU they have a lot of political discussions about open science and I was at a talk and then they ended the talk by open science is just science done right. It is excellent science. And isn't open science a necessary condition for excellent science in the 21st century? So they are really driving it. We don't know what will happen after the election, if they will still go on driving open science. But I think it's really important to not drive it just politically. You have to drive it from the researchers and the research students, of course. When we are talking about open access to publications, we talk a lot about different colors. And I would talk uh, you through the palette. So in the beginning, we started to talk about green open access. And green open access is when you take a copy of your last manuscript and put it in a repository and make it open access. And the positive thing of this is that we have our own control over the platform. It's working with the current publishing system and it's no charges for the authors. Then we can talk, is it cost effective? Is it good with the extra administration for the researchers and for the libraries? And the publishers have the copyright, still have the copyright within the green open access. You have given away your copyright to the publishers when you publish. And you can put your last manuscript in a, a repository. Then the publishers have started to put embargo times on it. It's from six months until 36 months in some cases. So is it open access when it's not direct open access? And I think that the Greenway is also built on the current system. It's dependent on the current system. We still pay the licenses for reading and then maybe we can put this with embargo. So this isn't sustainable for the future. It's one way, but we have to do it in another way as well. Then we talk about the hybrid. The hybrid is when you have a project with the founder, for instance, the research council, they say that you have to publish it in open access. Then the publishers said, okay, we can make that one way. You can buy one article within the journal to make it open access. Or, and that is also working with the current system. Authors can choose journals and audience. We have established platforms and practices. But it's not moving the system. We are still in a system where you pay for the reading and then you have to pay for the publishing. So it's increasing cost to pay for both publishing and read and the publishers control the market. The problem here is in the beginning, the publishers said, okay, this will be a way to move 
towards open access, but they have stayed within the system. They don't flip the journals to pure open access when they have enough uh, articles within a journal. They still have two money streams, one from the reading fee and one from the publishing fee. So this isn't sustainable at all for the future. Then we have the gold open access, and that is immediate open access. It can be affordable. It is often... So gold open access is when you have a journal which is only a pure open access journal. It's no reading fee. It's based on just publishing fees. So it, it creates immediate open access. It's more affordable than the hybrid publishing in some way. So I think it, the prices for publishing costs varies a lot, but it's cheaper in the pure gold open access journals. It could change the market if all the publishers go that direction and only serve for pure open access journals. But the problem is that the publisher often make lower tier or no status journals to pure open access. You have probably heard about the predatory journals cluttering the market. When predatory journals, they have bad editors, they don't make good peer review, but they sell to you the possibility to publish in the journal. And it's not a qualitative journal, so that's a problem. And with the pure open access, maybe old journals may have to close down that hasn't built a business model on it. And then within the palette, we are talking now about gray, browns, brown, black, diamond, different ways to reach open access, freemium. And this adds to confusion, I think, if you as researchers and doctoral students will think, think about open access as the palette and what is it to explain all those different routes to open access. So I think we should get rid of the colors and talk about immediate open access, not green, gold, etc. So in the future, the only open access is the immediate. You can find it by the green way and the gold way or the other ways, but, but why talk about the colors? Because we don't, we mix it up. How many have heard about Coalition S and Plan S? A few people. <laughs> I think it has been really discussed. This is a reaction to the system you had at EU level, you had one appointed person. His name was Robert Jan Smith. He was the envoy to, envoyee to come further with the open access discussion. And he was thinking about this and ha said, how can we drive the open access mandates? So he started to talk with the founders. Many of the founders in Europe have mandates for open access. And he said the only one that can really put pressures on the publishers is if we talk to the founders. So they started Coalition S within Science Europe, which is an organization for the research founders within Europe. So what is Plan S? It is the research founders' action plan to make their founded output available. It's an initiative aiming to push publishers to change, and I think that is really important. The beginning with this is to push publishers to change. But the reactions have been more on what will it be for me as a researcher, because it will happen things if the demands from the uh, founders go through. Then they address the rapidly increasing publishing cost. As I mentioned earlier, we are paying more and more for reading, paying more and more for publishing, 
and it isn't st sustainable for the future. Because if we continue to do that, we have to take the money somewhere from, and it could be teachers, it could be anything here that we have to spend money to give to the publishers that have revenues that is a bit too high in my <laughs> kind of view. And they want to encourage technical devel development and best practices. Goals for Plan S, creative common licensing on the open side. They say that the researchers should never give away their copyright to the publishers. You should keep the copyright and put a CC BY license on your article instead. And they want to update electronic platform and formats and allow text and data managing. Today, it's not allowed within the publisher's platforms. You have to ask for permission to make text and data mining on the publisher's platforms. And it's, then you have to go to each platform separately to do that as well. So it's a big problem, I think, text and data mining is maybe it will be a solution with the new Copyright Act that will allow text and data mining, but we will see what's happened. And they say there shouldn't be no, any embargoes, and we can work with transformative agreements to reach this plan. And I will talk more about that. And the Coalition S will start the plan in 2020, and evaluate the results in 2023. So what's the implications of Plan S? The publishers need to update policies and business models. Smaller publishers and repositories need to upgrade. And they say founding all to cover publication fees only for pure open access content. So in Plan S, they say that the hybrid model isn't acceptable for the future. We should only publish in pure open access. So researchers will have to make better informed decisions and libraries have to manage better deals and cash flows in the future. So Plan S have one main share objective. So after 1st of January 2020, scientific publications on the results from research founded by public grants provided by national and European research councils and funding bodies must be published in compliant open access journals or on compliant open access platforms. So they say also we can start new platforms to build new platforms outside of the old commercial publishers. That, like Wellcome Trust has done and Bill and uh, Gates Foundation and EU is also building an open access platform for the future. Then the plan is, is 10 simple rules and the most important is that the authors should retain the copyright of their publications the authors shouldn't pay it themselves, it should be the founders, it should be the universities. And that the hybrid model is not compliant with the above principles. So they are really trying to change the system in a fast way. And many researchers think it is too fast. Because we still have the merit system. By Plan S, they are saying if you have money from the founders, you can't choose any journal. You can only choose the pure open access journals. But then when they... This wasn't discussed in the beginning. So they say that they acknowledge transformative type of agreements. And a transformative agreement is something where you have an agreement for a publisher in Sweden, for instance, via the Bibson Consortia, that is hybrid journals, but is moving in the right direction. And they have a little bit more about how the transformative agreement should be, what it should be composed of. But then you have 
back all the high merit journals from different publishers if we have an agreement in Sweden. I, I will talk about the agreements we have signed in Sweden. So it's acceptable during a transition period to have those kind of transformative agreements. And I think for us that are negotiating with the publishers, Plan S is really good because we can say, we can sign a deal with you now, but in five years you have to change. And now we want a transformative agreement from you. And many of the publishers are really discussing it, but I will come back to that. Then we have... Can I, can I Well, it's a coalition and it's a suggestion. All the founders that have signed Plan S, they say we will monitor what our researchers are doing with money they get. <laughs> and we won't allow them to publish in hybrid journals except in transformative deals, for instance. So in, I come back to that. There are some founders in Sweden that have signed Plan S and are within the coalition S. Then, to, this is really an international question. We ha, when we are working on this, we have to have simple principles that we all use against when discussing with the publishers. So Libre is an organization for all the research libraries in Europe, and we set up five principles for negotiating open access. And those are really good as well. Because you have to have principles talking to them. And if we have principles together, we are stronger. So this is really a movement that this hasn't, hasn't anything to do with Plan S, but there are good principles to talk with the publishers. So I've been talking about the Bibs and Consortia, and you can see here it is our president, Astrid Söderberg Withing, that is the president of the Bibson Consortium's steering group or the chair of the steering group, then I'm the vice chair of the steering group. So we are making all the big uh, negotiations with the big publishers and deals for whole of all uh, universities and in Sweden. So negotiating transformative offsetting deals, it is rather other preconditions now. It is really a new market. All the publishers have different business models. We often work with pilots and different pilots with different uh, publishers. All the negotiations takes a lot more time and we have shorter agreements. So we have to spend a lot of time talking to different publishers and sometimes the only way for us to really say what we mean is to quit the deal and it has happened and I will come back to that as well. But today we have in Sweden, I think, we started in the steering committee decided that all our licensing should have an open access component. And we started before Plan S to discuss with the publishers, we don't want to pay more and more for the reading and more and more for the publishing costs. We will have that in one agreement. And now we have deals with Springer Compact. It is the old Springer, not Springer Nature. So it's the old Springer journals. So if you publish with an old Springer journal, everything is covered by the consortia. So you can freely get it open access directly. Institute of Physics, it's the same, De Groyter, Royal Society of Chemistry. If you publish with them, you will get it open access directly and it's centrally founded. Taylor and Francis, Cambridge University Press, Oxford University Press, and American Institute of Physics. So here are then deals with commercial publishers where you can publish and they are accepted by the founders that are within Plan S. So here is many qualitative journals within where you can publish even if Plan S go through. 
we are also talking in the uh, steering committee about why just sign deals with the commercial publishers. This is a commercial publishers, but only with the hybrid journals. Now we are looking at a deal with Spring and Nature and all their fully open access journals. So it's BMC and Springer and Nature Research. And I think the most growing ones is the uh, communications chemistry and communication physics and biology and scientific reports from Nature. So they are, and you can see the prices from Nature Communications. It's 4,290 euros per publication, per article. So we are talking with Spring and Nature about the contract for all Sweden, where we centrally found those journal, uh, articles from Sweden. We went out to the universities with a deal in November, but they turned it down because this is money that wasn't within the library budget before. This is something, the money came from from founders and from other places. But we thought this is really important, so we, we had to start discuss with the founders how we can finance this. And now we have talked with the Research Council, with Formas, with Forte, uh, and with Winova. And they are willing to go in to take 50% of the costs and the university is 50% of the cost. So I, hopefully we get a deal through in midsummer. So if I, I haven't mentioned in Sweden today, we have signatories for Plan S, is Formas, Forte, and Vinova will probably sign, Riksbankens Jubileumsfond have signed. Uh, the Research Council has said that they stand by the principles, but they think that the timeline is too fast. So Plan S, they went out and had a consultation. In the beginning, many researchers thought Plan S hasn't been talking to researchers. They have only been talking to the administrators. Now they went out and asked for, send in your thoughts about Plan S on a consultation and they got around 600 answers and they are now looking at the implementation plan and will come with a new implementation plan in uh, the end of May and then we will see what it, how it will affect you as researchers and the whole scientific community. But I think the Plan S is something that can still, I think the discussion is really important, both for the universities, for the researchers, for everyone to discuss those matters, for, because we can't continue as we are doing today. At Stockholm University, we followed the, how you are publishing. Where are you publishing in pure open access? journals at Stockholm University. So, so we found out that the foremost used here is PLOS, Copernicus, Frontiers, and MDPI. So we made licenses with them as well. And now if you publish with any of those publishers, you get it for, we cover the cost centrally. So here at Stockholm University, we really have many agreements for the, publish the cost of publishing. So to <coughs> make those change happen, the question about open access has to be on the president's, the university management's board uh, table. So in the Swedish Rectors Conference, SUHF, it's, it is an arena for cooperation among the rectors and among the universities. They have a library directors forum and they have an open science group. And the Rectors Conference uh, elects 
the people in the steering committee and the open access advisory group and things like that. So that is really an important thing when you are working on those questions about open access, that the uh, Swedish rectors really think about those questions. In 2016, we thought that things aren't moving that fast in Sweden at all about open access. So I was to the rector's conference and talked about open science and said that open science isn't a library question. Libraries could help in building infrastructure, lobbying and educating, but open access should be a question for the management of the universities because this is something we have to change and it's only the rector's that can mandate the change. So in, I've been there each year, I think, and talked about open science and mostly open access. And in 2018, we had big struggles with the big publishers Elsevier on how to get a transformative deal with Elsevier. We went with the deal we got from Elsevier and talked to the Rector's Conference, and they advised us to cancel the agreement with Elsevier. And that was done in July last year. So we have lived without the big publishers, Elsevier, for nearly a whole year. And all is due to that Elsevier don't want to change. They, will ta they want to have two separate business models, one for reading, and one for publishing. So we cancelled with Elsevier. Is that just uh, Stockholm University or is it? It's the whole Bibsam consortium. So it's all Swedish universities. So we don't. The good thing with, that we have was in our early contract, we had also the archives. So today, the only things that you can't read is the newest published articles. But I will come back to how we have done to help you. It was very important to cancel with Elsevier because no, the publishers think that we must buy from them. I don't think now it is a disrupted system. You can get your article other ways. So it's not that big, and uh, we, we can see that in Germany they have also cancelled the agreement. And now this year, University of California has cancelled their agreement, Norway have cancelled their agreement, and Hungary has cancelled their ag agreement. And they wouldn't have done that if Sweden hasn't cancelled as well. So it's really important, an international movement. And it's not against Elsevier, but we have to set... Elsevier is the publishers that really don't want to change. And they have many important journals and many of our researchers, our editors and peer reviewing for Elsevier. But we really had to take a stand to make something to change. So. Elsevier, when you go into Elsevier and try to get one of the latest articles, you will get this feedback form, and it was set up in the beginning, and they wanted really to get uh, feedback back from the researchers, and they thought that the researchers should be really angry. But most of the researchers that answered in the feedback form said that, OK, we understand what Bib is doing, and we're standing behind it. I will stop peer review with uh, Elsevier and things like that. So then there are many, I think, many researchers that never heard about the cancellation and don't understand why they can't get that article. So Elsevier, in the beginning, they sent us the feedback they got, but they stopped to send it to us, and I think that's why, <laughs> because they didn't get the feedback that they wanted. And we got a lot of positive response from different researchers. I hope Ibsen will continue to stand up for open, transparent and affordable publication of research articles. 
Then we got some, of course, some that are really angry. You'd really have to solve it now directly. I don't care about open access and I don't care about the costs because I haven't seen the costs in the system with tall publishing where you publish and we pay for the reading. The researcher doesn't see what it costs. They don't know what the budget from the university library costs for all this reading. Then here at Stockholm University, we decided directly to use the money we freed up to get, go back to the researchers. So we said that with the money we will pay for all articles in pure open access journals. So today, if you will publish with an not in hybrid journals, but with the pure open access journals, we cover the cost centrally. It's really easy. It's just before uh, you send a question to the library and they answer that it, it's okay, it's an um, open access journal and we will cover the cost. So that, this annoyed Elsevier a lot that we went out directly and said that this money that we pay to you, we should use it for open access. Then other universities, Lynn Kerping did the same way as we, and we made different survival guides on how to survive without Elsevier. So here at Stockholm University, if you are searching within the search box here, you can get directly via service get the article. If you don't, you can see it, get the article by, via get it now, and the library pays for the article. But today we have a, I think if we talk about Swedish crowns, the deal with Elsevier was about nine million and we had paid 200,000 for different articles that the researchers or student has asked from Elsevier. And many of the, as I understand that many uh, researchers have asked colleagues about the article and things like that. So it, we have to help, but different universities have done different things. So here is Karolinska's way to how to access Elsevier material after that. And they say use network or get it from the library or different. You can install a browser plugin to get unpaywall or open access button and things like that. So we have tried to help the researchers, of course, because our cancellation shouldn't hinder research. And this is rather annoying. What Elsevier did, they went to the Swedish internet providers and threatened to sue them if they didn't block Sci-Hub. And this is the answer from Bahnhof in Sweden got really annoyed when Elsevier said you have to close everything to Sci-Hub. And they closed the links to Elsevier. And this is when you see when you try we are Bahnhof to get an Elsevier link. So they discuss about Elsevier and discuss about the market, about scholarly communication. Then you can get a link to get to Elsevier. But this is, I think that Elsevier should use their money to spend it on better things for open access than to making lawsuits because they will never uh, win in the future. But this is the reaction now. But they didn't sue soon at the internet provider for the universities. They didn't dare to do it, I think. I don't know really why I've asked them, but I didn't get an answer. And this internationally, it was really many that was interested. So if you want to know more about why we cancelled the agreement with Elsevier, it's a pod here that we talked about it. And really many people has listened to it. So lessons learned when talking to the publishers is that support from the vice chancellors is extremely important. Political backing as well. When uh, we talked to Elsevier, we said in the beginning in the negotiations, we saw that we aren't coming in anywhere. So we had a 
top meeting with elsewhere where we had people from the um, government with us from the Department of Education and we had the uh, Research Council and we had the uh, Rector's Conference and things like that to say to Elsevier, we are united about this, you have to change. So we have had political backing as well. Then it's preparation is everything. It took us two years of negotiations before we landed it to cancel and then we got a lot of information out to the researchers and out to the organization about it. And preparation, we, we have to have control of our own publication data. Before we were reliant on to get the data from the publishers and we asked Elsevier, can you get us the data on what we are paying for article processing charges? And in the beginning we got the data. Then they said after a while, oh no, we have a technical problem, we can't get you the data. And we didn't really understand it. Then we had to start talking to them again and now they say that they can get us the data, but we need our own data to compare with it. So here at Stockholm University we are really tracking everything we are paying for APCs because before we didn't know what we are paying for the publishing cost, we only knew what we are paying for the reading costs. So we had to track everything and get our own data. A communication plan is needed Today, researchers seem to have managed fairly well without current access to SFE journals. Services like Get It Now are not as heavily used as we expected, and you should never underestimate your opponent, of course, when you are talking to Elsevier. Now, in Sweden, we have, via the Bibsom Consortium, we have an investigation what's uh, happen for the researchers when they can't uh, get access to El Elsevier journals and we, it will be ready in July. So it's really interesting data. Yes? What happens when you use the Get It Now service? Do, does the library pay for that individual article? Yes, and you get it directly to your computer. So we pay $27 for the article each article and the researchers get it or students get it too. It takes varies between two to ten minutes. So it, it is okay. <laughs> so what's happening with Elsevier? They asked for the rector, some of the rectors were going to Japan and Elsevier said okay the Swedish rectors are in Japan could we have a meeting in Japan? And then Astrid said to Elsevier, well, if Elsevier want to talk to Sweden, they have to come to Sweden. Then we had an informal meeting just before Christmas about could we start negotiating again? And we didn't get that far at that informal meeting. Then we got a letter from Elsevier asking for a meeting with uh, Bibs and Consortia. So we had a top meeting uh, in December 18th last year and we had the educational department, we had the research council, we had everything here and they had people from the management team at Elsevier and we started our discussions again. And this was really disappointing because we thought when Elsevier came to talk to us that they would have something new to bring to the table because we sent the objectives for the meeting beforehand. We said again 100% open access in a sustainable way and we said that maybe the outcome could be that we sign a memorandum of understanding on how we should proceed in the discussions between Elsevier and Bibsam. So that meeting was really this disappointed. Astrid sent a letter back to Elsevier and said that why did you ask for the meeting when you didn't have anything new to come to the table with? 
Now we have been in the process of negotiating an MOU with Elsevier and what the wording should be within the MOU. And now we have an MOU. So we will start negotiating again. We have the terms what we should negotiate about, but we, let's see what's happened. I think it's really big pressure on Elsevier now when we heard that University of California, Norway, Hungary, Sweden, Germany have cancelled, so they have to start rethinking now, but we haven't seen it yet. And it's not only Elsevier we have problems with, we have the same problems with Wiley. We met them last week and we, our negotiations had stranded because they are not offering enough open access for the money we are ready for paying. So we have started a discussion about an MAU with Wiley as well. So, but we won't cancel with Wiley now, we will continue to have it. it enough with one big publishers today. Uh, so we are doing everything to get Elsevier to change and hopefully they will do it, but we won't take a bad deal from Elsevier in the long run. So this is really an international movement. We had a meeting in Berlin in uh, December where we were participants from 37 nations and five continents discussing aligning strategies to enable open access. There I, at that meeting we had a pre-meeting with the countries that really are working hard on to negotiate open access. So University of California was there as well and they told us now we will maybe cancel and think. We had discussions about it. But I think this is really something happening now. If we should change the system for scholarly communication, it will be now or never, I think. It is now we have the momentum to do things with planners and other things. And the final conference statement is that the whole world wants this thing and we try to work together to receive open access to publications. Shall we take 10 minutes and then I talk a little bit about research data. Uh, research data is the other pillow that we have really been working on. It's not my expertise. It was a colleague that should talk about it, but she couldn't come. So I will take some things that we are doing at Stockholm University with research data management. So we talk again about open science as default. What are we doing? Research data management at Stockholm universities and what services are we delivering for research data management? Here you have it again, our precedent about open science as default but I think it's a different background. Um, strategies today for the research data management work is to have the researcher, of course, in the middle and the ethics and the legislations. Then we have within the administration, we have worked together, the library, the research office, the archive, and the IT department to look for strategies for research data management work. So we had tried to cooperate and coordinate and not starting with the techniques, but starting with the strategy, the structures, and then go to the systems. And we have had really strong support from the university management team that we should work on those questions again. And Research participation has been really necessary in these discussions. Not to do something from the administration, it should be from the researchers and work on small pilots and things like that. And we have had a lot of lectures and communication on open science and spread them out. So one of the things we have done here as the first university in 
Sweden is to have a research data policy. And I think that is really important for both the university. We know what we have to do to work with the research data. And for you as researchers, you know what you can demand from the university for the research data management. And we also have different rules for research data management. But this is policies, but you need to start to work with the policies. What is research data management? It is through the whole process of when you are conducting research from starting to planning and then collecting and everything. You have always research data and you have to handle your research data. And finally, maybe you also publish your research data. So it's a cycle that goes through the whole research process. And I think it's Carl back there that made this great picture as well. Have you heard about FAIR? With research data, we are all discussing FAIR research data. So research data should be findable. It should be permanent links for and archiving a metadata. It should be accessible, no barriers and no lock-in. It should be interoperable. It should, you could move your research data from different platforms. And it should be reu reusable. So this is really international. We talk about fair research data. That is the goal for the future. And I think the most important here is we have it in our research data policy as well. Don't give away the research data to the publishers and pay for the research data as well. Many of the journals now demand that you publish your research data as well. And if we don't have services at Stockholm University or in Sweden, you have to pay the publisher for the research data again. They will never say that they will own the research data, but they will take really big money to handle the research data as well. So for the future, it's really important that we in Sweden I think we have a couple of years to do this. Otherwise, we will have to pay that also to the publishers. So we have had, we have had projects for two years on how to work on it. And we have had the research reference group with, from all the faculties here at Stockholm University and have regular meetings about it. Uh, and here is the website about the research data management services we give as support at Stockholm University. So we have links about how to share the data, which resources, a data management <coughs> plan, as I said before, the Research Council now demands that you have a re uh, data management plan if you get a project from them. You don't have to send it in. They say you have to have it if you get accepted. Then, at the end of the project, you have to send in the plan. So we have to start having data management plans. And we are now working on a solution here at Stockholm University to help you to work with the data management plan. We were waiting for a national solution. We really talk to the research council, we need to have a national solution, but it takes so long time, so we have to have one at Stockholm University. We have different guidelines. We have our services and support we can give from the administration to the researchers, and we have information of the different uh, data repositories that you can choose in Sweden or international. So the research data team offers support and skilled expertise on how to get started with research data management, assisting with the selection of suitable services for storage, publication, and preservation of research data, 
improving the discoverability of research data, locating guideline rights and restrictions applicable to research data management. And here you have the contact details to the research data team at Stockholm University that is based on the library, but it's different expertise from legal and from different places at the university. And the research office, of course, is working on the research data team. But today we don't have all services. I think in the future we really have to have a central solution where you can work with your data during the whole process that we saw in the beginning. But we're not there yet, but we are working on it and it will take some time. But as I said, we have to do it within a couple of years, otherwise we will be stuck to the publishers for that. And the data management plan is that you should start with your project, you should think about the data description, how you think you will handle the data during the whole, whole the process, and thinking about the legal and ethical requirements, everything, and the long time preservation. So this is something you can ask for to get more information, how to make a data management plan. And I think in the future more and more founders will say that you need a data management plan when you are looking for a project. Now we are working with the IT department here on some small storage pilots with the s and consortium, it's a consortium in Sweden with the big universities looking on how can we handle research data and we have a pilot with, or we are working on a pilot with Sunet and with SNIC, where how to handle the published, how you can get help to publish your research data. Uh, Electronic lab notebooks is something that is really demand from the different institutions at the university. Uh, I think that <laughs> they have worked on the IT department for two years to get something, but we have restarted the discussions about ELN. It's really important and it has taken too long time. As we said, it's many researchers that really are driving for to share their data as well as their publications. And here are different uh, researchers from Stockholm University that, that have engaged and really promote that you should work with open data as well as open articles. And here you have some links about what are happening here at Stockholm University about research data. And I can, you have my PowerPoint so you can send it out to the ones that are interested. So that was the things I had to say. Questions? What is your dream scenario? <laughs> <laughs> In five years or something like that. My dream scenario is that we will work more and more for open science, that more and more researchers are thinking, why should science be open? And I think the first way is to change the way of scholarly communication. You should be with research data. It should also be merits to publish your research data. It should be cited. It should be everything. So it, it, different workflows and then I think science should be built on. We shouldn't lock in science at all for the best of the whole universe, I think. So my, the, I think we can change the future, but it's now it's a momentum to really start changing it. But I'm not sure. <laughs> Are you comfortable making you know, an amount an appropriate amount available so that we know what, what is too much to pay for gold open access 
And, you know, there are even Elsevier journals that are called open access now. Can we get support centrally to pay for articles being published in those? Yes, we say that all we are paying for all pure open access uh, articles, even within Elsevier, of course. So we have spent some money on pure open access journals with Elsevier. And a reasonable amount, it's really hard to say. I think it, it goes from... 500 euros to 5,000, and I don't think 5,000 is reasonable, and uh, 500, maybe that is reasonable, but I think we're talking about what we are discussing within the transformative deals, it's around something like 2,000 euros. I don't say that we shouldn't pay for our publishing industry, but I don't like to pay that much when you see that Elsevier has about 40% of the things that we pay to them is pure revenue. And I think that those 40% should be to research, not to commercial publishers. But of course we have to pay for making things quality and things like that. But today it is too expensive. We have to do something about it. So it's, today it's more reasonable to pay for the amounts that is within pure open access journals, not the hybrids, I think. You mentioned that um, journals are increasing their costs a lot. Um, I was curious what was driving that. <laughs> that just well, well I, I was talking about that. It, it is one thing. They are commercial publishers. They are really driving their revenue. Then they have now in the changing environment, they have crappy back systems. They don't have systems to work with open access streams and things like that. And who should pay? It's you, not them. So they are increasing their costs. And some costs, of course, they have to invest in to make better systems and everything. But I think we should have a shared risk on that. And I think in the future we should work on, for instance, here at Stockholm University, we have the Stockholm University Press that is a pure access, pure open access publishing. <laughs> and we started that for monographs to have an infrastructure for pure open access monographs as well that is peer reviewed with researchers from here. And I think in the future we have to look at different solutions within the universities, not only the commercial publishers, but we can't, can't start, we have to start building it now, but now we are, have to rely on the commercial publishers and drive them to change. Uh, would it be possible to uh, get help with a list of journals that we should publish in? Because I wasn't, re I'm not really sure like which, like within our, uh, our research field. I, I don't say that we can get a list where you should publish, but if you have a question about the journal, you can send it to the library then, and they can get an answer if this is a pure open access journal, or if it's a predatory journal or, or anything. But I don't think that we should have a list on journals that you can publish in. This is all very confusing. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it is. Uh, so I wonder, I mean, Elsevier is, is a bad example. I like the way that you have, you seem to push the field forward. But do you see that they are really an exception? Is there, do you see change in other publishers? So like, well, many I of us like to publish in the American Chemical Society journals. We are starting to negotiate with the American Chemical Society in a couple of weeks, and they are really hard to <laughs> negotiate with as well. But I met with the American Institute of Physics last week, and they are really thinking, oh, we have to change the system. This is a broken system. And I have meetings with Cambridge University Press, and they think we will go from an tall a publisher to an open access publisher in five years, a pure open access publisher. So it's so it different. I think 
if the big publishing houses want to survive, they have to do something. Otherwise, it will be... They, Elsevier, I'm sure that they have strategies to change, but they want to get as much money until they have to change. But I think they have to change. But it's really hard when we are talking to you. You have to think for yourself. I don't... I can say what you should do. You have to think about your career as well. You have to publish where you get merits, of course. And then you have to think about what, what is ethical and what do I want to see a future in the scholarly communication for the future. So it's really hard for you as young researchers. What is the landscape now when it's changing and what should my strategies be? But it's only yourself that have to think about that. But we can help you by talking about it. Have you started to see any shift away from the, the current merit system of publishing in top journals and impact factors? You know, in, in Sweden, for example, is there anything happening? Or at Stockholm University, as the president said, stop worrying about impact factors. You know, is that going to happen after we deal with the journals? Or? No, I think a big change here is, for instance, that Stockholm University has signed DORA. And all the founders within Plan S, they signed DORA. And in DORA you say you shouldn't look at the impact factors as a merit system. And I think there are a lot of discussions about this in different countries and in internationally. But many researchers are really conservative and think about this is a system that is working and go back to reading all research when you evaluate a researcher. It's, many say that that isn't po possible. And we really have, now I think we have a system where we, it said publish or perish. We really say that publish a lot. And we have to change that system as well. You should publish quality and so it's really hard, but I, that discussion, that must change about the merit system. And I really hope that Stockholm University will drive that more about how we are implementing DORA and what will happen. And especially for you young researchers, it is a very important discussion. The old researchers that really have already had their merits, it's you that we really have to think of how can you get your merits for the future. Any more questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you.